to learn about white-tailed deer. And uh, Friends of Schmeekly Reserve is the sponsor of this event, and we are very, very happy. I'm a member of the Friends, and uh, there are other members of the Friends here as well. Um, we are very, very pleased that we've uh, begun the process of having people from the university and people who are doing research in our community come and have the forum to be able to talk about what they're doing. So we're very excited for this, so we really appreciate you guys coming. Andrew Voigt grew up near Milwaukee, and his love of the outdoors brought him to UW-Stevens Point, like many of us. Uh, he's been involved in the student chapter of the Wildlife Society's White-Tailed Deer Project for three years, and just recently he was working with the Department of Natural Resources uh, in Chiapta. So we're very happy to have you here. Uh, Eric Cannonia, or Mr. C, as his friends call him, was born and raised in a small rural town in southwestern Illinois. Which one? Uh, it's a it's uh, Bunker Hill, it's outside of it, it's out a little bit south of St. Louis. Okay, all right, so a small rural town. Uh, and he was introduced to the outdoors at an early age and turned into a passion, and leading him to come also to UWSP for a wildlife degree. And after graduation, he hopes to attend graduate school, school and earn a master's degree in wildlife management or white-tailed deer ecology. Uh, he wants to pursue a career where he can do his part to improve the quality of wild lands so future generations can enjoy them, which is kind of like why the friends are here, is to make sure that Schmeekly Reserve is here for those who come after us. So with that, I will stop talking and turn it over to these gentlemen and let them uh, present. Thank you. Thanks. All right, uh, my name is Andrew. Um, so let's get started here. So I'm going to start talking about when I first started um, back in the fall of 2012. Um, one of the friends of mine was going to take over and be the lead for the TWS deer project. And at that time, there were two traps out in Schmeekley. There was one, which I believe is the one on the far right. And then this box trap that's now here it used to be right down by the entrance of Schmeekley, but we moved that one because it had so much graffiti and everyone knew where it was. <laughs> it, was it, it was just, everyone knew where it was, so we decided to move that one. And that fall we decided we wanted to um, build two more traps so that we would have um, a couple more out there for the upcoming uh, trapping season in spring. Um, so yeah, and then pretty much when uh, fall semester ended, we, over winter break, we started baiting the deer traps, um, and they're suspended, locked open, so animals can just go in and out of them as they please. Um, and we, we baited the traps with just uh, corn feed that you buy from Flea Farm um, for two or three weeks ahead of time so that the deer were acclimated to going in and out of the traps and uh, using them in that sense. And then the way the box trap works, <coughs> Eric has some pictures, some better pictures, but it's in the top corner. I'm sure if you've walked through Schmeekly, you've seen some of them out there. Um, it pretty much has a trigger mechanism on the side um, that holds the rope, that holds the doors open, and it has a trip wire that goes through. And so when the deer walks in to the pile of corn, it'll hit that trip wire and the doors will close on each side. Um, for trapping, the first year, I believe we ordered six radio collars. It was what we were able to get with the budget that we had through TWS and SGA um, at Stevens Point. And we ended up having three of each kind of doe collar, three doe collars and three buck collars. The difference between the collars is that the doe collars are just fixed leather all the way around, and the buck collars have um, an elastic band in them with pleats so that it can stretch and um, shrink back down for the rut. Uh, we use the same collar design that the DNR used in their deer research that, and their trapping that they've been doing the 
all the past four years they didn't trap this winter because the study's wrapping up. Um, they are at the two study sites, one up in Shackton, or down in Shackton for me actually. Um, and then uh, up in Winter, Wisconsin by the Schwamigan. So I was um, in contact with them a lot um, for trapping procedure things and equipment. Um, stuff like that, you got, that's the stuff you guys just want to look at. <clears throat> so we would trap, the way it would work when we were ready to trap is that we would um, set the traps the night before, around 3 or 4 p.m. Um, and then the next morning, at first light, we'd go out and check all the traps um, so that uh, if people were in the reserve and that kind of thing, we want to minimize the amount of stress on the animals. Um, so yeah, if we, let, we didn't want to leave them set and potentially have a deer in a trap in the middle of the day when people could be walking around, that kind of thing. Um, and so when we have a deer in the trap, the most important thing obviously is to try and stay quiet and to minimize, do everything you can to minimize the amount of stress on the animal. Um, so we would normally have two people that would put on hockey masks or hockey helmets. You can see it in the top of the picture there. Um, and we have a, like a 12 by 12 foot game net. It's stretched out over the door in that top right hand picture. Um, so what we would do is we'd stretch that over the door and then we would lift the door up and the deer would run out um, towards the light and get tangled in the net and then we would grab the deer and manually restrain the deer. It seems pretty wild to people when you tell them that you tackle deer. <laughs> um, and it's really nerve-wracking the first time you do it. <laughs> uh, but it, you get used to it and it kind of develop a method of grabbing them around their side and kind of tucking their legs underneath them. And you, if you get good at it, you can get them to lay down uh, with all four feet underneath them, which is what you want to go for because that's the most natural position for them to be in as opposed to laying on their side with their feet sprawled out. Mm -hmm. um, and they can kick people if they have their feet laying out like that, so that also was a personal safety issue. Um, and then we have a blindfold. We don't have a fancy one like in the bottom corner that goes over the deer's face. That deer's actually um, asleep. That's a picture from volunteering with the DNR. They, uh, they would drug some of the deer if they were really tangled in the net bad or um, different methods like that. So that deer is under, that's why I know he's restraining it. Um, but then they would put the collar on and do everything they had to do and then uh, give it a reversal and then come back and they'd monitor, watch the deer as it uh, walked away and made sure it was okay after coming back from being down. Um, but we used a similar type of mask that would cover up the deer eyes. And it's amazing how much calmer the animal is when they can't see. It's like a night and day difference between if they can see what's happening and if they have that covering their eyes. A lot of times they'll calm down and not make any noise the whole time, which is crazy because when you first grab them, they're screaming. <laughs> um, yeah, and so we, at that point, we would untangle. The first thing we'd do is put the blindfold on and then untangle the deer from the net as best we could and get the net out of the way. And then we would ear tag and radio collar the deer if it was a, a deer that we were going to go ahead and radio collar. Um, and then the release was a pretty simple procedure. Um, anyway, it boiled down to just having, you know, having one person on the animal and, and just pulling the face mask off and just rolling off to the side and the deer gets up and runs away. And it's usually pretty painless. And that's that bottom left picture is right after letting a deer go in. It's starting to face with the deer. Yeah, it's a, it's a tuck and roll <laughs> procedure. 
<laughs> just stay down until someone tells you that yours not on top of you. <laughs> Our other project leader um, learned that the hard part of he just scooted back and uh, uh, let's say he got kicked pretty good. <laughs> So then once the deer is radio collared, um, the collars give out a radio frequency, um, or they give out a radio frequency at a specified frequency. If you looked at the right on the collar, you could probably see that numbers on the other labeling. Um, and so you pick, can pick up a ping from that receiver, or from the collar with a radio receiver. And that looks like this. Pretty simple, and it just attaches to just looks like this. I can let you guys look at this. It's pretty pretty simple. And that's the antenna. Um, and so you can pick up um, basically a direction of where the, uh, the signal is coming from. Um, and that, that is data from a GPS collar that we um, received that was not a radio collar. Um, the way that worked is or one of the our professors had an extra one from some research he did, so he gave it to us. And so we were able to put the GPS collar on a dough. And that is, that took a location every six hours for about 100 days. Mm -hmm. And so all those dots are locations of where this deer was. In 2013, it was basically February to March, maybe. So it was, it was, in, it was later in winter. And then we recovered the color. Now, the way those work is they have an automatic release on them, and so after 100 days, the collar dropped off, and then we use, it still gives out the radio frequency, so we use that to go in and find the collar laying on the ground. And then it plugs in to run through a computer program, and you can upload all that information. Is this one deer? That's, this that was one, one deer, yeah. <laughs> and what you can actually see on this picture, but there's, um, in the group picture, there's a spot actually way down there that it travels. <laughs> <laughs> And so then with, in the, the spring of 2013, we had five deer that we had radio collared that had enough, that we had collected enough radio telemetry points for to um, estimate home ranges for those four individuals. And that is the graph there from the GIS output of the different ranges. And it basically takes all the points gathered from doing the radio telemetry. And it, um, it's called a kernel home range estimator. It basically takes the locations and it uses an area around that location. Um, and if there are any other locations, within that area, it weights how strongly those points um, are associated, so then it can give you that ellipse of where um, the average home range would be. In, in that data collection, is there a temporal marking too? Not, you know, this is like a whole chunk of time, mm -hmm. but is there like a, or, a temporal ordering? Uh, we like had where, where, where does the deer first go and where does it go second? Right, this is just an output of all the locations we had when we get our when we had the raw data. It's it is you know a location that we took on this day and this okay. time. Okay. We just never uh -huh. put it in uh, media form right. in that in that sense. But yeah, you, we could have you know <laughs> given it a a color scheme to time-wise, yeah. you know, seeing where it popped around to. And then that year, me and the other crew leader at that time, um, what we presented at research symposium was we compared the average size of the home ranges of these deer that were in Shemekli to home range sizes 
of other urban deer and other rural deer um, from literature. And he wanted, he was kind of the uh, forefront for that um, idea. That was a project he did in one of his courses. So that's what we use that information for. Um, but he was trying to see if the reserve in any way was, or the location of the reserve was restricting um, the size of the deer's home range. So if they were strictly just staying in Schmickley or if they were moving around. Um, and what they, he ended up finding was that the home ranges differed statistically from those home ranges of other urban deer. So the average size was larger for these Schmickley deer. The, the home range size was larger on average than for the urban deer home ranges that he had looked up um, in the um, scientific journal. And then they were they tested not statistically different from the rural home range size, which was quite a bit, on average, is quite a bit larger than the size in Schmigley, but statistically they ended up not being different. So that was what we looked at in 2013. In 2014, um, we, I had a set of data back from when I first started in 2012 that was enough data on four deer to get home ranges from 2012. And then we also, then in 2014, the spring, we had enough data from a completely different set of deer that I was able to analyze and get two different home ranges, um, sets of home ranges, actually. And when thinking of something to put together um, for that year's symposium, the biggest thing that stuck out was the difference in winters between 2012 and 2014. <laughs> 2012 was quite a mild winter um, compared to 2014, and so what I wanted to look at was if those home range sizes um, were being affected by winter severity. Um, and a lot of research talks about winter severity index, but it's really pretty much just a gauge of temperature and snow depth. And so I just had this plotted out, which was the average daily temperature through the, um, it's a, well, how many days is it? It's about 50 days, but it's, um, it's the, the days that we were taking our telemetry locations. Um, and then the snow depth is there too, the, the blue was 20. And that was um, the accumulation on the ground at that time on that day. And so then, <coughs> we were able to compare, or when we statistically compared those, obviously, 2014 had a lot higher, more snow, and much colder temperatures consistently throughout that um, period that we were tracking the deer. Um, so I wanted to see if that correlated to the deer having smaller or bigger home ranges that winter. And we found that in 2014, the home ranges were significantly smaller on average, most likely due to just the fact that it's harder to get around in the deep snow. Um, there was some, when I was looking up scientific papers about that, there was some evidence of maybe having colder temperatures linking to wanting to move around more and, and not being able to find food, so moving, you know, wanting to move more to find resources and, um, you know, keep your body temperature up when moving more. But we ended up finding that it did, you know, shrink the size of the home range a little bit. Eric, if you want to take away from here, for you yeah. Okay, so in my part of the talk, I'm going to talk about three main objectives here. The first one being the current and future direction of the project. Uh, this is my first year as being a co-leader of the project. Andrew's been on for a couple years now, and he's graduating this spring. So I'll be taking over the project with another co-leader who couldn't be here today. So I'll be talking about what we plan to do in the future and what we're doing as of right now, as well as, as, well as go over the importance of telemetry, what it is, its uses, and a little bit of our equipment. Uh, Andrew already 
went over that a little bit, but I'm actually going to turn one of the callers on so you guys can hear actually what we're looking for whenever uh, we get, go out there to do telemetry. And lastly, I'm going to cover how this project benefits us and the community. So, um, Inside my future and current direction topic, I'll be going over some behavioral ecology of white-tailed deer. Uh, our new, our most current study we're doing is a trap site utilization study. One of the future things we're going to work on is a possible trail camera survey on Schmeekly, as well as putting more deer, or ear tags on deer to have personal identification and getting more people involved. So uh, one of the main things that we work on in the deer project is we focus a lot on behavioral ecology of white-tailed deer. Um, personally, I find it to be one of the most fascinating aspects of ecology. I'm sure Andrew would agree, especially with a charismatic big game species <laughs> such as deer. But it's also very important in management terms. Um, you can't really expect to write management plans and effectively manage for a certain species if you don't understand the behavior and how the deer utilizes the landscape. So behavior ecology is really important in that aspect. And we, we have the unique opportunity of working with urban deer. Um, most of the deer in Schmeekle, as you've seen with the uh, home range densities, they live mainly in Schmeekle and uh, Century, but they still have to interact with the public and uh, we still have an effect on them. So these deer, even though they're free range, they do act different than your, um, the deer that live in maybe the north woods or more the agricultural zones. So with uh, human development on the rise, it's just inevitable having more human and deer interactions. So understanding how these deer behave are just, it's going to be better for us in the future as managers. Um, so this, what this ties into is Andrew's studies worked a lot with the home range analysis of the deer and in order to get home range data you have to collar the deer. And in order to collar the deer you have to trap the deer. So what I wanted to know was, I wanted to know how the deer were utilizing the trap sites throughout Schmeekly. So uh, this year I started a trap site utilization study and we're going to be looking at three different things. What we've done is we put trail cameras at each of the four traps. Um, at Schmeekly, and we are looking at the activity times. We've delineated a day into two zones, the first being sunset to sunrise, and the second being sunrise to sunset. So we want to see, after our study is done, are deer using the site more often in zone one versus zone two, and we'll run a statistical test to see if there's a difference on that. Uh, second being the sex ratio. Um, you guys, I'm sure, utilize Schmeekly's trails often, so you'll know that you see mainly does throughout Schmeekly. There are some bucks throughout Schmeekly, usually um, through the rut we'll see some more bucks going through. Um, and right now there's a lot of button bucks. So we want to see these trail cameras that we're using, they're running 24-7. So are there, deer actually, are there bucks actually in Schmeekly that might be held up and not moving until dark? Or are there deer or bucks from outside of Schmeekly that are moving in and maybe just utilizing our bait at the trap site? And maybe this could tell us how we could adjust the trapping technique to capture them as well. Um, the probably the most important thing we're looking at is the age structure. And the question is, does age structure have an effect on capture success? Most of the deer that we capture throughout the project are immature deer, mainly fawns. So we don't really get a good representation of the population. You don't get to catch a lot of big deer or a lot of older bucks. Our collars usually last, what, three years? Is if we can get three years out of them? Yeah, three years, years is usually the top end for the battery life on the collars. Yeah, and that's, it might seem like a long time, but for deer in an urban population, uh, that's really nothing, because they don't have predators. The only thing they really have to worry about is getting hit by cars, so they can live quite a long time. We have deer in here that are collar, and we don't even know who who collar them. They have different collars and they're not ours. None of the ones that we've used. So, I mean, how old would you think some of the oldest deer can? I have no idea. That's pretty more than, more than four years. Yeah. <laughs> and we don't really get to catch those deer, so hopefully uh, we can, with the data here, we can figure out, adjust their trapping technique to better represent the population of deer. So if anybody is actually interested in the results of this, or if it's the data is still, we're still doing this stuff. Uh, we actually just started, um, just bought with the project's money. Oops. 
You're advancing your slides. <laughs> a bunch of these trail cameras, so we're going to be putting those out and uh, seeing what happens with that. And I'll be presenting this data at the symposium along with one of the other research projects, which is pretty much the same thing as what Andrew's done in the past. We have, uh, we have I think, six deer that have working radio collars on them right now and we are taking locations on them to compare their home range size to the deer that we um, found the home range sizes of last year. We don't really have an assumption of what, if they're going to be different, but we're thinking as long as winters are relatively the same, the home range sizes still should be the same. And it's a, we already have kind of the process down on everything that we need to do for this. And it's just something easy for us project leaders to take on the side and compare. And if um, if there is a difference, maybe then the next year they can try to figure out why. Was there construction, disease, um, cold weather, a drought during the summer, something like that. But that data will also be presented um, at symposium as well. Another thing that I'm hoping to do with these trail cameras for next year is to start a trail camera survey. And trail camera surveys are being used more widely now through the with wildlife biologists and other wildlife consultants and what it pretty much consists of is having a set number of cameras per acre and you leave them out for a certain amount of time, it's usually two weeks over bait and the uh, previous data from researchers and other wild wildlife biologists have suggested that you can get up to 90% of the animals that are utilizing your area in those two weeks. So you add up all that data and they get a bunch of different formulas and pretty much what you'll be able to figure out is a deer density per square mile, buck to doe ratio, doe to fawn ratio, as well as an age class structure. Um, and this is being used widely, like I said, um, with actual wildlife biologists. So this would be really neat to kind of see what Schmeekly has to offer and give us practice in doing it, because we might be actually, if we get jobs with wildlife biologists or consultants uh, doing this exact stuff. And I think when Andrew, didn't you do trail camera surveys last summer? Yeah, when I, this past summer and fall, I worked um, with the DNR um, in Shack, and I was just north of Appleton um, in their eastern farmland study site and the research project they've been doing. Um, this was just after their last trapping season, but we were monitoring uh, the radio collar gear that they had in that area um, through the fall, or through the summer and fall. Um, they had about 150 radio collar deer throughout Portage County, Allegheny County, and Shawnee County. Um, and so we were monitoring those deer and getting weekly locations and um, investigating mortalities, um, which is something we can talk about with the radio collars in a bit. But we also ran a pilot trail camera survey um, because they were the DNR had very consistent mortality buck mortality rates. Um, from the past three years um, from all the radio collar data, so they're getting a very consistent number. And they wanted to see if a trail camera survey could produce that same number to test the validity of trail cameras to gauge um, buck mortality. So how that worked was we had um, cameras put out the 10 days before the opening of bow season, and cameras put out the 10 days prior to gun season to see how many um, individual bucks we could capture on camera and then before and after lead to mortality rate. So that's what that, that was. So yeah, they can be used for a lot of different uh, aspects and management. They're pretty nice because it's non-invasive. The cameras run 24-7. New cameras are really small. And uh, they can usually run up to six months on a set of batteries. So that's, that's a lot of time. The only thing, thing is they're prone to be installed as you can see we, we're going to be locking these things up pretty tight but people still find a way. Um, you'll be amazed at how far people go to steal cameras. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something we're hoping to do in the future and maybe make a research project out of that depending on the data. <coughs> so the next thing I'm going to talk about is the involvement with the project. So every week at uh, the university we have a our student chapter of the Wildlife Society meeting and we'll go up and talk and talk about new things with the project and our project I would say is the most sought after project for individuals to go on I think last or two weeks ago 
I was there and we asked who was all interested and almost everybody in the 170 raised their hand. And uh, we just can't really, we can't take all that many people out in a semester. It's really hard to get everybody out. We usually try to get four people out with us each time we go trapping just to make everything go, go smoothly and less stress on the deer. And whenever I send an email out to all the members asking who would be interested in going, I'm, I haven't even lifted my finger off the send button. I'm getting messages. <laughs> I get up to 40 messages in uh, less than an hour. Wow. Uh, pretty competitive. People just really want to go. So we're trying to get all the new members out who haven't had a chance, and a lot of the seniors who are now graduating and still have not had a chance. One of the things that we're we're hoping to do is to increase our uh, increase the duration of trapping. Uh, we're going to talk to some professors and Schmeekly about that to try to get as many people out as possible and to give us and them more experience with. Trapping and maybe if we trap at different times of the year, um, we'll be able to pull some different deer out of here instead of the same ones we're getting. So maybe maybe some mature, more mature deer or some more bucks. Um, we have uh, Dr. Jeanette is our advisor for the project, and he's an ungulate specialist as well as Dr. Heinstrom is a new professor at the university who's uh, dealt a lot with deer. So I'm going to be talking with them a lot lately or uh, coming up here. And, trying to figure out new things to do with the project. Um, as well as that, we are, um, we bought bigger ear tags, kind of like the ones you see here. We, before, we've used little ear tags, but uh, we're starting to use these bigger ones now because we're using these trail cameras. And uh, within the trail cameras, we'll be able to personally identify a certain deer. And this also might be a cool thing for kids to come out and as they're walking the trails, they might continually see um, a certain number of deer and they get to kind of know them. And I know a lot of people will see a lot of the deer, but it's hard to prove, is that the same one? And one of my studies was actually trying to figure out if the same deer were coming back to the traps, but uh, one of the problems I ran into was trying to prove that was the same deer. And I might really know it's the same deer just by looking at them so much, but it's, it's what you can prove. And uh, this will help us determine if it's the same deer. Another cool thing with this is if maybe if this deer visits our far trap at 6 o'clock in the evening and then we'll get it all the way on the other side at later in the night we'll be able to at least say that that deer traversed that entire span um, in one night. And uh, like I said, it'd be kind of cool to have all, as many deer as we could tag and kids going through the, the reserve get to see certain deer and Maybe we could start something with the citizen science thing, uh, marking where you've seen what deer at what time. It might be another thing to get people involved who are outside of the university doing something with the project. And with that said, we have about, well, we have 33 deer ear tag. And from what right now, the past system? three years, we've tagged 33 deer. Um, some of them have gotten hit by cars or gotten shot by the golf course. But <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, if, uh, with the personal identification, thing, those, with those tags, they're, they're hard to see. You wouldn't be able to really, if you were 30 yards away, you'd have a heck of a time trying to see what the number was. So yeah, they're going to put the bigger tags. Um, we have, like I said, I mean, we have, we have, you know, deer, but with your trail camera stuff, we wouldn't even, most of the time, be able to even see what numbers were on the tag. Yeah, I mean, I just had our cameras out for a week, and I've gotten a lot of the deer that we have collared on camera. And you can see the little the yellow, little yellow tag, but there's no way you can read them. So we just know that that's one of our deer, but we don't know who it is. And some of our deer are sporting collars that don't work now. So it'd be really nice to say, oh, that's uh, this deer. We know it's at least this old based on how old it was when we caught it and how long ago that was. So that'll be another thing to uh, possibly work on with age of these animals. So as um, one of the major parts of the study besides trapping is doing the radio telemetry. All of Andrew's work was with radio telemetry. And um, pretty much how radio telemetry works is we put those GPS call or we put those telemetry call callers uh, on the deer. And this one like I said is a buck collar. It has this stretchable piece here for the rut and we always put this biodegradable foam and it creates a perfect snug fit whenever as the deer grows it'll rub this foam off, foam off and 
and uh, so it's not too snug, but you really want it, you don't want it too loose. Uh, when people say, oh, we think your collars are too, uh, too tight because we've seen deer that have uh, rubbing on their neck, that's actually a sign of it being too loose. It's the head collar being able to move. It's kind of like putting a collar on your dog. You really want two fingers to be able to fit underneath it and not much more else. So, um, so these, uh, once activated, they have a magnet over here usually that uh, keeps this deactivated. Once activated, this produces a VHF radio frequency that corresponds to this little transmitter here. And we'll, we take the frequency, we, we mark it down before we put it on the deer, and we'll set the frequency into this thing here, the receiver. And uh, it'll pick it up usually with the, uh, the antenna over there, and that's how we, we uh, get locations on the deer. We have to take three locations in order to um, or three, three sets of locations in order to get one location because what this does is if a deer is over here and we uh, we get a strong ping I'll take my compass out and find the bearing of the strongest ping and that'll be that'll be one straight shot Oops. and then we'll move around to another location and do another shot and we want intersecting points to kind of make a triangle and then uh, our goal is to do this as fast and accurate as possible to decrease our error because in, um, in order to make our home range estimates work we need to have an error under 5,000 square meters I think it is and uh, it might sound like a lot but it's really it's really not that big a lot of other projects have um, way higher uh, measurements of error and a lot of times what we do is telemetry is in the evening so that's the uh, that's when the deer are moving the most and you got people running through Schmeekly and they'll, they'll spook a deer so you might have a dead set point that's perfect and then by the time while you're moving to the next spot somebody spooked a deer and it ran 200 yards and it started walking and then your other one's perfect and your other one's perfect and you're still going to have a high error so it's, sometimes it's a pain to uh, to get accurate data with that which is nice for those GPS collars because that you don't have to do any of this it sends a location at hourly intervals to your computer um, but these collars cost that like, Four hundred dollars or something. Those cost about two hundred fifty to three hundred fifty. Um, the I know the the GPS ones are in the thousand range, um, and then the satellite ones are even more. The yeah. ones that because like the one we had was just it stores it internally. You had to retrieve it and plug it into the computer. But they do make ones that satellite the information as it takes the information mm -hmm. to your computer, and those are. I mean, yeah. I would I would expect paying five thousand dollars or something. Yeah, for this one. Well, we are. Um, I'm in the process of talking with the school and writing a grant to get a few of these GPS collars to uh, study dispersal. Because so we, we catch mainly um, fawns and immature deer, but this year and a couple last year we caught a lot of immature or fawn bucks, and uh, they stick around throughout the winter and a little bit into the fall. But once the fall hits, they usually hit their dispersal pattern and they're gone. So we lose that collar. And with this being a VHF collar. We would have to drive around and try to find the deer. We just don't have the resources to that, do that. So if we had a GPS collar, it doesn't matter where the deer ends up, we'll get data from it. So uh, what we've been looking at, the collars that stay on the deer forever and they still send it to us, um, those are just a little over $1,000. But the collars that send them straight to our computer and they, they blow off after a certain time, um, the clips just kind of fall off and uh, then you go retrieve the data and re you can reuse the collar, those are $2,500 per collar, plus a data fee um, to use whoever makes the collar's data service. So I'm in the process of writing a grant for that, and there's a lot of uh, research that's being done at the moment to try to study dispersal movements, especially with the onset of CWD. Um, people originally don't think deer move too much, but uh, they can move quite a bit. I was just in Indiana at a Midwest Fish and Wildlife Conference and a guy who's a graduate from Point uh, was doing a study down in Illinois and in a less than a two week span the deer moved over five counties. <laughs> so and those are big um, central Illinois farmland counties and if that deer was infected with something then you know it just moved five counties in two weeks and possibly could infect other animals. So I know the DNR is doing a lot of studies trying to figure out uh, more on dispersal and movement patterns such as that. Um, so let me see here. I'm going to put this down. I'm going to go in the back. Mm. Mm. 
Okay, so that's what it's all about. Yeah. <laughs> this is what we're looking for. Uh, whenever we do our study, and the closer it is, like, so this is really close. So you can't really no. Now you kind of can. Um, yeah. Uh, we want to we want to get a definitive zone where. Like this is where we're getting the point really strong, and when we move off a little bit, it drops off, and that's that'll increase our accuracy. But depending on how close the deer is and what terrain it's in, um, that's uh, sometimes hard to do. Yeah, it depends because with uh, the topography can make a difference, and what type of antenna you're using. And when we went out with the DNR, when we had um, deer that we couldn't find anymore. Um, after, sort of after we had maybe four or five deer that had dispersed, we couldn't find them, and then we would fly for them with a, a plane that had the telemetry gear mount onto it. And generally, these collars can pick up, you can pick them up from maybe two or three miles away if they're a brand new collar. And when we're in the plane, we pretty much have a five mile um, wingspan on each side where we can pick it up from. So it's a lot easier to hear them from up in the air. So, I mean, the topography and higher. How you're looking for them uh, can definitely make a difference. And then as they get older, um, they start to get weaker and weaker and weaker as the battery life comes down. And I'm going to go back to one. So this deer, right? We tracked it and sprinkled and it just moved, right? Yep. It came back. Then that, yep. What that, the frequency was she? Uh, I don't remember that. Um, yeah, that. that yeah, that doe just up and left and was gone for maybe, it was probably gone for just for the winter time. And then it came back. So it's just kind of an and interesting And there, there is, I mean, from, there is some decent evidence um, related to deer having kind of a summer range and a winter range. And so that, that could have been um, some of the case there as well, too. Do you remember when the elk was killed? That we had collar. Oh yeah, the three years ago we had a, like a four point. This is the biggest deer that I've caught in Schmidt. It was it was a, a four point buck. It was you know an adult buck. It wasn't um, by huge or any means, but it, that one was uh, that one was shot opening weekend of bow, ten miles south of here. <laughs> um, the next the following year, um, south south of Plover, one ways, a farmer had contacted me. Um, and it was an eight point at that time. So yeah, and uh, so they they'll move. That's and the juvenile bucks are the ones that tend to do it the most. When I was working for the DNR, this uh, the master student is working on analyzing all the dispersal data because that's kind of a big popular thing right now that's coming forward is juvenile dispersal. And when I was when we were tracking these deer, we'd have them move at 15 to 20 miles, no problem. Um, those juvenile males and just up and leave and find somewhere else to, to call home. Yeah, and one of the, they have, usually have two main dispersals um, in their lifetime, and it starts out the first year. Um, so the, the deer that were born this last spring, uh, they're still called fawns, and this, this dispersal is somewhat mixed. It depends on habitat and uh, the quality of the habitat. Uh, usually they'll get, they'll stay with them, their moms through the whole year, and then coming up this year when the mother starts to get ready to have birth, if uh, quality of the habitat isn't so well, and sometimes just doesn't matter, she'll she'll kick the deer off, and he might not go very far. He'll stay somewhere in the area, but he won't be hugging his mom like he used to be. And uh, then coming back into the fall when we usually lose these deer. Um, they move, it's just kind of an internal trigger that they need to get out of there. They establish their own home range, and a lot of times, um, if they don't go themselves, they'll get pushed out by another buck. So if any of you hunt and kind of see a, uh, a yearling deer, um, just walking around, kind of looking around, <laughs> but he's never been there, there's a chance that he's really never been there. And he's, he's on his dispersal pattern. And there's some pretty good evidence to support that. So. Did you see Brittany's data when you were at the, did you, what was her buck dispersal? 80%. 80% of the yearling bucks they covered uh -huh. dispersed and never came back to where they were out college. Just because you have fallen corn on your property and uh, their bucks doesn't mean that they're actually going to stick around. 
So there's another picture of the colors. Um, here's what it looks like when we're typing in the frequency. That's one of the frequency from the D direction to inch weekly right now. I just, this is not from our study. I didn't know if Andrew was going to have examples of this, but this is another telemetry data study that just shows overlapping home range of some dominant bucks, individual bucks, wherever this was taken. Right now, it's pretty much leaves like, who does this benefit? Um, this is a pretty rare project to have. Like I said, I went to Indiana for the Midwest student for the Midwest Wildlife Conference, and I met a lot of wildlife students who are in really good schools, and they have quality um, wildlife society programs, student chapters in there. When I tell them, they ask, oh, well, what kind of research are you doing? And I said, well, I'm a gear project leader. This is what I do. And they're jolly at the floor. Like, you actually do that? And I was like, yes. Yeah. So they're like, well, that's what you're hoping to do when you get a job. And this is what the DNR does, this exact stuff. So we're really fortunate to have the opportunity to do this stuff. I'm actually applying for a job in, uh, with South Dakota State University this summer, and pretty much everything that they want on the list, I'm like, have it, have it, have it. So I'm hoping if they haven't already filled the position, I'll get the call. And that's actually from a uh, former pointer as well. She uh, graduated two years ago, and she was the TWS president. So it really has an impact on us, the, the field of wildlife is really, really competitive. So anything that we can do to stand out, um, used to be you needed just a bachelor's degree. Now you need a master's degree, and that's just super competitive because it's not like a normal master's program. We can't apply to the school. We can't. It's called a non-thesis master. And we just go to school for two more years and get our master's. But the real, the best way to go about it is actually apply for a master's assistantship, and it's like applying for one job. Especially for someone like me, I really want to work with deer uh, or game species, and everybody want to work, wants to work with them. So anything I can do to make myself stand out is going to really benefit me in the future, and uh, hopefully I can pay off my student debt. <laughs> uh, so yeah, like I said, it uh, really benefits us as UWSP students, because even if uh, so we only usually have two, to, three to four um, leaders on the project a year, but people that get to go out with us, they still have experience with it. They know how the process works. They have live animal handling experience. Um, we take them out doing telemetry. Um, we're going to start taking them out, setting the traps, just to get them involved and they know how this stuff works. And it also, um, it also benefits the community of Stephen Point because we're doing a study on these deer or urban deer. So this data is pretty much directly pointed at Stevens Point as well as possibly being applicable to other urban areas. So we're, um, if there's uh, ever management issues, which I'm sure there is inside Stevens Point, I mean our data can be used with estimating home range sizes and all that stuff and hopefully will help resolve a lot of issues. And it's, I mean it's a really, really good relationship that UWSB has with Schmeek League. We come right out here, I don't have to drive anywhere. Um, and it really helps us so we don't have to spend our money on other like travel fees. We don't even uh, we write off all of our travel fees as non-existent, so we can spend our budget on other things such as collars, um, improvements for the traps, and whatnot. So it's just it makes us a more tight-knit community, I would say. And especially if we can get the, get more deer with these larger, um, larger larger tags. And I'd like to talk to Schmeekly about doing possible. Maybe have an interactive map or something where people can come in and they can say, hey, I've seen this deer, and they can just do something like that. I know in the TNR we had, uh, I, think we, I think it was with the alligator that we used to have, and uh, they had a little map of the enclosure, and you could write when you saw it or where it was and when you saw it or something like that. Just kind of do some citizen science and get outside people involved with it as well. So that's pretty much, I think, the end of the... Uh, what we have to say, we we have a slideshow of a bunch of pictures from the past couple of years, so we're just going to have that going while we answer any questions you guys might have. Right, sir, go ahead. Do you know, did Century do something with the fences on the golf course that in 2012 there was a lot of deer, like looked like you tracked a lot of deer out on the golf course, and then in 14 you didn't? Um, yeah, I, I know they have been actively 
shooting deer. Um, I, I, I was surprised. The first time they told was in 2013, they came and I heard like through a roundabout way, someone was like, yeah, well, someone in Schmigley has, has two year radio cars that shot two radio car deer with, you know, agriculture damage tags, you know, they, with, you know, keeping the golf course from getting chewed up or whatever. Um, so, okay. And then and it seemed like at that point, then all of a sudden it was like a regular thing. And it was, oh, golf course shot another one, golf course shot another one. So, I mean, yeah, that makes it hard too, because then, um, Good then that, uh, I thought the original plan there was to have the fences so the deer couldn't get in. You had tall enough fences. And I know, and I know the, I know the fences the way they are now, or at least how I remember them, aren't tall enough. And I know they always leave. There was a, when I was doing radio telemetry, there was always a back gate on the one back end that was just yeah. always open anyway. And, and but, I know they still get through because two of ours were shot this this last year. Um, so they're getting they're getting through there somehow. I don't know how, but sometimes we see them lined up five or six feet in a row, waiting to go through. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Go under. Yeah. Down by the creek on the end of. That depends. The different yeah. years where you got a cap in the fence. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, you don't. You know, I used to play golf out there a fair amount when I worked at Century years ago, and we never really saw a deer on the course anymore. And I thought, oh, that must be working pretty well, but apparently it isn't. <laughs> I don't think any of the deer that we have colored now, at least when I've been out doing that telemetry, um, we do is we, when, when we get our points, we have a, a telemetry, what would I say? Like, so oh, it's, a, it's an Excel spreadsheet that a professor at UW Madison, he um, put together the program for the uh, triangulation. <laughs> Estimate, so it pretty much it, you know, we input all our information and we run it, and it estimates our location and an associated error with that location. It does an image overlay with an estimated location of the deer, and we have a map of Schmeichel, so we'll be able to part of our uh, studies will to say is it in Schmeichel or out of Schmeichel, and all of this year's data, at least every one of our collar deer have been in Schmeichel. Uh, we just radio collar two button bucks a couple weeks ago. Um, so those are the newest addition to the... I know your, your, your study is basically for urban deer, right? Yeah. Uh, and how do you hope to advance beyond that? I mean, uh, you say you're, you're going to get into this. I mean, are you going to do I mean, How about the, the rural deer? I mean, are you going to do anything with those? Uh, we. We can't really do anything with those, um, at least for what the power that we have. Um, and all since these are urban deer, we can only assume that it applies to urban deer. We can't really say. I mean, this is. as far as the the, the uh, dispersal, is that part of? I mean, how far they get away from their basically where they were born, mm -hmm. and how far they're going, they're going to leave their home range. Um. That's, that's part of it too. That, that part is uh, we don't know if we're going to even get the collar, so it's kind of when we get it, we'll see what data we get and try to figure out what can we do with that data. Because even if we do get them, we're probably only going to get two collars just because they're so expensive. And are, we, I still, you know, are you hoping to get any any work outside of Schmeekly? Sort of. I mean, with, uh, the, with Schmeekly being uh, so convenient for, and so close um, and having those traps there, it, I mean, most I I would foresee it being difficult for the student organization to put any um, um, effort into finding private landowners and moving outside of Schmigley itself just for the sake of um, it's 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 very accessible for students and um, it's a just it's hard to move traps around. I know. The box traps are are big and they're pretty permanent. The ones we have, at least, um, it would <clears throat> it would take somebody a lot of man hours and a lot of time outside of school to to kind of mobilize that, um, which is I think is difficult with a a student organization. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. 
Um, the uh, I've got actually made me think about tree haven and mm -hmm. the land there as a possibility as well, but that's a side point. Um, the thought I had when you mentioned the citizen science idea, which I think is wonderful, it's a great idea. Um, you could really, it wouldn't be very hard to design like a, an app for people, everybody's almost everybody's walking around with an iPhone or something like that. And you, you could have a pretty simple app that would have like, you know, a Google Map application on it. The person could just like type in the number of the deer and it would like, you would have their location basically. So I mean, it could be actually pretty, you know, it could be pretty sophisticated citizen science, I think, that could be done. And that was just an idea. I was when I was making this, I was trying to think of uh, this year we we got a quite an influx of new TWS members, mm -hmm. and um, I was trying to think how can we get more people involved? How we, can we also get uh, outside members involved? Mm -hmm. And that was just one thing that came to mind with the use of these uh, bigger name tags we're going to use. I would have no idea how to do that. Yeah, I mean, no, 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 but you've got fellow students on campus who do yeah. know how to use yeah. apps. And some of these, in terms of geolocating and Google Maps, are not that not that complicated. Mm -hmm. So you, you, that would be a neat uh, possibility. It would be definitely something to look into and for future yeah. for, future, for future purposes. Yeah. Yep. So when the deer have these like things on their backs, doesn't it annoy them? Um, it, it doesn't really change any of their behavior. So they, I mean, it's kind of like your dog wearing a collar. If he's never worn a collar at first, he might not notice it, but after a while, if they get used to it. And, uh, all their behavior is still the same. Um, so it's, it's nothing too bad. And there, there's an actual formula with how big of collars we can use. It's like 5% of the animal's body weight. You yeah. can't exceed that. So, um, yeah, there's a, <laughs> there's a, 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 a way of calculating um, what size of collar is appropriate for the size of the animal that it's going to have. They actually have collars from, for all of them here, so a little grouse and uh, anything in between. So it's pretty cool how you can uh, have a tiny grouse and this little collar that's about that big that gives off a radio frequency for that. Good. Any other questions? Okay. Well, I would like to say thank you to both yes. of you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sitting here being amazed at the level of work that you're doing and the, the esteem that you're held in by other people in similar circumstances. And it once again reinforces how lucky we are to have something like this here. And one of the things I was thinking too is that connecting the dots backwards, you will look back in 10 years and you will have created a database that you know is a continuation that people can build on and use. And it wasn't there when you started. And that's actually one of the things we're hoping to do with continuing the home range um, analysis comparing from the year before is that they can go back and they'll, they'll have this in our file, all of our data is saved to the file for future project leaders to use. So that would be just really cool for, okay, well, the average size has been the same and then maybe one year something's really different. Why? Right. Well, then they can figure out, there's another project, they can figure out why um, that is. And actually, I live pretty close to Southern Illinois University Carbondale, which has a really good wildlife program as well. And I was pretty much dead set on going there until I went up here and I saw all the programs. So Shemekele actually did have a pretty profound impact on my decision to come here uh, just to do this. Because I know over there they do stuff similar to this, but uh, they're doing work with the actual DNR, so they can only do stuff when the DNR has help. And we're, we do this all the time, so this is really awesome for, uh, for people like us. I would also like to say to, you, to your uh, fellow students, uh, encourage them, because we really want student presentations uh, at Schmeekley Reserve, and the friends are really, really interested in partnering. If you're talking about citizen science and that sort of thing, the friends of Schmeekley intend to be here after you graduate. So if there are things that we can do to continue the science and continue the study and continue the building of relationships and gathering information, we really want to be about that. Um, I thought this was an interesting picture that you had in there, because this is the uh, PhD student for the DNR's deer research study, um, Andrew Norton. Um, 
he uh, he's the one looking at the butt mortality rates. And then the girl on the right, her name is Christine, I forget her last name, but she was a crew leader um, working for the deer, the DNR, um, their deer research. She led um, a field crew uh, up in Winter, Wisconsin, and now she is permanently up in Clam Lake working with the new elk population that's up there um, on all the research rate of color and trapping that they're doing. So I've got to keep out of that picture. Are they? Uh... That's a deer that. Uh, this is a picture from the DNR's research. Um, that's a, a deer that's immobilized. Can you go to the one that Kurt and I have? 